So um, I just want to introduce you or say thanks first of all to everybody to, for attending today. Uh, thanks very much. Um, my name is Anne-Marie McInerney and I'm a librarian in Dublin City Library and Archive and I'll be hosting the talk today. Um, the title of today's talk is uh, Lord Mayor Lawrence O'Neill and the Revolutionary Mansion House. And this talk will focus on Dublin's Mansion House and its occupant, Lord Mayor Lawrence O'Neill, and how the Mansion House and O'Neill played a pivotal role in many of the events of the Irish Revolutionary Era. Today, Councillor Michal McDonka and historian in residence Mary Muldowney will discuss this fascinating topic for us. So just introducing our speakers, uh, Councillor Michal McDonagh served as Ard Vera, so that's Lord Mayor of Dublin during 2017 and 2018, and he is the author of the book The Mansion House and the Irish Revolution. He has been a Dublin City Councillor since 2011, representing the Don Donamede electoral area. And then we have Mary Muldowney, who is one of our Dublin City Council historian in residence, and with a particular responsibility for the Dublin Central area. Mary's research interests include labour and working class history, and she is an advocate of public history as a tool for empowering communities, especially in economically and socially deprived areas. She is the author of books and journal articles, including contributions to each of the volumes of History on Your Doorstep, which was published by Dublin City Council. And Mary is also a member of the organising committee of the Irish Labour History Society and the Grange Gorman Histories Expert Group. So there, there are today's speakers. Uh, so I would like to thank both speakers for giving this talk today. And I would also like to introduce you to my co-host and colleague, Stephanie Rousseau. Stephanie is archivist in Dublin City Archive and she kindly agreed to co-host today for us. And also, if you have any questions at the end of the talk, you can pop them in the Q&A chat box and we'll get around to them then when the talk is over. So without holding you too much longer, I would like to hand you over to today's speakers, Michal and Mary, and I think Michal is going to start. So thanks very much. Thanks, Henry. Well, thanks uh, very much. I'm, I'm very uh, glad to uh, be able to join uh, this uh, webinar. And uh, as we mark the centenary of the, the truce, which of course was centered uh, at the Mansion House. I think Mary um, maybe uh, teed up to ask me some questions, maybe to, to get the ball rolling, if that's okay, Mary. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll stay away from the contentious ones we came across. I'll save those for later. Uh, yeah, I mean, the book you wrote, uh, which I strongly recommend and which is available from Dublin City Libraries, about the mansion house during the revolutionary years and the revolution. It's not just about Lawrence O'Neill, it starts earlier. Uh, you mentioned the, um, in 2012, with the kickoff of the revolution, revolutionary period, so to speak, and the role that the Mansion House was playing then. Could you maybe kick up, start talking about that a little bit and its role too with the women's suffrage campaign? Yeah, um, the, the first chapter of the book I, I titled The End and the Beginning because uh, in many ways, 1912, it was the end of the very long agitation for home rule for Ireland. Uh, because it had been legislated for. Um, and the Mansion House was the scene of a Home Rule Convention, which was almost a celebration by the Home Rule Party that they finally achieved this in legislation. And it seemed that Home Rule was about to be granted for Ireland. Uh, but there was contention, obviously. You had the Unionist and Conservative Party agitation against Home Rule. You also had... Uh, becoming very active, the women's suffrage movement. And that Home Rule Convention, uh, the most remarkable thing about it was that women were excluded and women who came to demand the vote were actually uh, assaulted on the streets. And Hannah Shee Skeffington was very prominent uh, in that uh, event. And it was the same year they went on then to uh, adopt more militant tactics. And so, I think it's a very appropriate kind of beginning uh, for the story of the Mansion House in those revolutionary years. And then the following year, uh, 1913, uh, the House was the centre of efforts to find a resolution to the, to the lockout. Uh, there was a body called the Dublin Industrial Peace Committee was established, based in the Mansion House, uh, under the patronage of the Lord Mayor Lorcan Sherlock. 
And a, a number of uh, prominent individuals were involved in that. People like Thomas Kettle, uh, Thomas McDonough, Joseph Plunkett. And it was qu it's quite notable if you look at the series of meetings that were held in the in the mansion house, including one addressed by Yates, W.B. Yates. Uh, the sympathy of both the committee and the audience was very much with the workers, the locked out workers. And it, it, the, the peace committee, it couldn't find a resolution, basically because the employers weren't, uh, they didn't want to engage. Uh, they, they essentially, they wanted to smash the union. But the, the, the house, again, the mansion house was seen, I suppose, as a place where possibly resolution could be found and that that kind of pattern continued it it became a kind of a neutral space you know a place where uh, a safe place for people to negotiate to talk um and that was especially so under uh, Lawrence O'Neill when he became Lord Mayor mm. I mean one of the things that struck me about Lord Mayor Lawrence O'Neill in particular but even some of the others was the incredible energy we expended in the job in those days. Uh, one of the things that was happening, for instance, in 1913 was uh, the corporation investigation into the housing situation in the later part of the year. And you mention O'Neill, uh, it wasn't O'Neill at that stage, sorry, uh, O'Neill did work later, but the uh, investigation and Alderman Tom Kelly's role as the uh, chair of the housing committee. Um, That's right, yeah. Could you maybe talk a little bit about how the uh, Mansion House, not just in terms of revolutionary politics, but I suppose the day-to-day -day politics and such serious. Yeah, issues. well, well, that's interesting. You mentioned Tom Kelly. He was a veteran councillor. He was a Sinn Féin councillor, and he had done an awful lot on the, the deplorable housing conditions in the city, which, of course, were highlighted very much during the lockout. And there were various different investigations, but there was a scheme uh, to for, the, for the, the corporation to provide housing built by the corporation, which is really the first time such a, a scheme was um, undertaken. Uh, now, this was this was delayed, obviously, by the, the, the outbreak of the European war and then the, you know, the, the 1916 rising and all the events that happened. But um, they, they had to they had to actually hold uh, what was, I think, called an inquiry to I suppose, uh, test the feasibility of the scheme. And eventually that was held. Uh, Tom Kelly was due to take over as Lord Mayor in 1920, but he had been imprisoned by the British and his health was very badly affected. So he was actually elected by the corporation uh, as Lord Mayor, but he never took up the position. And Lawrence O'Neill continued. Uh, mm -hmm. However, uh, Lawrence O'Neill then took over the, cha the chairpersonship of the housing committee, which Tom Kelly had. And the, the outcome of that in the heel of the hunt, mid twenties, was the Merino housing scheme, yeah. which had its, you know, it, it, it had its origins way back before the war. Uh, but th they were very much involved in that. Um, of course, they had to go to the British Local Government Board and so on. Uh, so it was, it was a tortuous process. Um, I won't make comparisons with today. I'll just leave that hanging. But uh, <laughs> it, it, as you say, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't just uh, purely political uh, mm. matters. They were dealing with social and economic matters. And O'Neill himself was uh, quite interested and committed to improving social conditions in Dublin. And he, he seems to have, a fairly, have had a fairly good relationship with the trade union movement as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, sorry to be jumping about all over the place chronologically, but um, there were so many issues happening. Obviously, uh, the 1916 Rising had a big impact on uh, the city, but also on Lawrence O'Neill personally. And can you say something well, about that? Well, that's right. That? Well, O'Neill described himself as a paranoid. He, he never became a member of Sinn Féin. But he wasn't he wasn't uh, affiliated to the Home Rule Party so much either. He he uh, he was fairly independent, and like many people in that position, I think that was reinforced as the the European War went on because the John Redmond's party became more and more tied to the British government in terms of recruiting and so on, 
uh, and the, the promise of home rule seemed to be uh, fading into the distance. Uh, his son was a doctor and he, was, he actually served in the British Army Medical Corps. Um, now O'Neill, after the rising, he was still a councillor, he wasn't elected mayor until 1917, but in 1916 he was one of the hundreds of people who were rounded up after the rising and he was held in Richmond prison. But he, he, he was released after 12 days, I think, uh, partly due to the intervention of his son. So he, he, he showed after that and for all his years as a mayor, particular interest in the plight of political prisoners and their families. And that was one of, I suppose, the themes of his mayorality. Um, he, 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 he put a lot of effort into assisting the prisoners and, and their families. Um, as I say, he was elected in, in 1917 and that coincided with the resurgence of Sinn Féin, um, the by-elections and so on. And the Mansion House was very much uh, the centre of a lot of those uh, key meetings. And one of the really important ones was called by um, Count Plunkett, uh, who had won the Roscommon by-election. And uh, th the forces that were later to form the new Sinn Féin later in the year, they met at Plunkett's conference. And there's a very interesting quote from Thomas Dillon. He, he later became National Secretary of Sinn Féin. But in this, he, he identifies tensions that were there that were, I suppose, glossed over and were to later to emerge at the time of the treaty. And he said that this is in April 1917. At that meeting, it was most dramatic to observe how when the parties on the platform representing Arthur Griffiths Sinn Féin and the volunteers became involved in angry altercations. The delegates from all over the country who filled the round room impressed on their leaders their horror of a split and insisted on their coming to a friendly agreement. So he, he mentioned Sinn Féin and the volunteers. Sinn Féin at that stage before it, 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 it developed, I suppose, later that year, would, would have still been seen very much as Griffith's organisation, Arthur Griffith's organisation, and more moderate than the volunteers would have been very much under the influence of the IRB and, and seen as Republican. So he, he's identifying those tensions, which um, were largely, I suppose, hidden. They, 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 they united under the flag of the Republic later in the year when Sinn Féin held its Ardèche but they did emerge, emerge later. Um, as I mentioned, the prisoners, O'Neill then, uh, he was very much involved in attempts to resolve the hunger strike in Mount Joy. Uh, he visited Thomas Ash uh, a day before he died. Of course, yeah. he died from force feeding. And uh, it was to, to O'Neill that Ash said, uh, I die in a good cause, you know, even though I, I, I may die or continue my hunger strike. But in fact, it was the it was the force feeding. So as I said, he was very interested in the plight of prisoners. Um, the Ardesh, the Sinn Féin Ardesh of nineteen seventeen, which adopted uh, a constitution calling for an Irish Republic, uh, that was held in the in the round room of the Mansion House. Um, and then maybe I suppose you could nearly say the most important meeting that was held there prior to the first doll was the meeting which kicked off the anti-conscription anti campaign. And this was uh, hugely important. The um, I'm going to try and share the screen now, uh, which is always a dangerous moment, but I'll, I'll do my best. Now, um, th th this, uh, if people can see it, this shows the uh, what is now known as the ladies, the Lord Mayor's uh, drawing room in the front of the mansion house. And this is where the representatives of the trade union movement, the Home Rule Party and Sinn Féin, uh, under the chair of, of Lawrence O'Neill, met in April 1918 uh, to organise a campaign against conscription. It had been, uh, the bill had been passed in the British House of Commons uh, to conscript uh, Irishmen to the British Army. And the Home Rule Party had withdrawn uh, under John Dillon at this stage. John Redmond had died. Uh, they had withdrawn from Westminster. And in fact, that was the last time there was any substantial number of Irish nationalist representatives in Westminster because they, they withdrew. And then later that year, the election happened and, and the, the, the Home Rule Party was more or less wiped out uh, electorally. So in this uh, drawing, you can see Lawrence O'Neill uh, standing. He's holding the pledge against conscription. 
on the right of the picture is John Dillon, the leader of the Irish party in Westminster. And in the centre of the picture, uh, under the window, you have uh, William O'Brien and uh, uh, Tom Johnson. And they were trade union representatives and they were hugely important uh, in this campaign because uh, probably the key to its success, uh, as well as the pledge which was signed by hundreds of thousands of people all over Ireland, was the uh, general strike which shut down most of the country for, for a, a, an entire day. Uh, on the left of the picture you can see uh, Eamon de Valera and Arthur Griffith who represented Sinn Féin uh, at the meeting. And it was seen really that the, the Irish Party's day was done really because the, it was seen that the abstentionist uh, policy of Sinn Féin, the, 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 the resistance to conscription uh, in, a, in an alliance with the trade union movement would succeed as indeed it did and conscription was never uh, was never actually um introduced so could i stop you for a minute i'll let you back. in there mary because i'll, yes. I'll run on and on <laughs> well no it's not that at all but before we move on to the war of independence and the, the great stuff um one of the things that's very, or not a thing, but one of the uh, obvious absences from that picture would be a woman. <laughs> and I just to go back to the Sinn Féin Convention of 1917, uh, that was contentious for another reason in the, uh, basically the refusal as at first, Griffiths didn't want any women involved, and it did eventually take the efforts of the Corlin and Doctor, the group of women, mainly from Anina Meharan, who came forward to insist that there be some representation. So this is how you had uh, the enormous number of two women being put forward in the 1918 election for Sinn Féin. Uh, one being, of course, Constance Markovitch, who was elected and the other being Winnie Carney, who wasn't. Um, perhaps you could comment on those absences because I think it was a defining moment in the shape of the state that followed after the events of the next few years in that even at that point, uh, those who, shall we say, won the civil war were very resistant to the involvement of women and then a lot of their social policy followed on from that. Well, it certainly did, yeah. And I mean, uh, there were signs at the time. There were some, of course, who did oppose uh, the full involvement of women. Um, the 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 Ardesh, uh, I, I think that I, it came to a head at the Ardesh, the Sinn Féin Ardesh, um, in in nineteen seventeen. And as you say, Corlin and Jock D, the what the, which what they call the League of Women Delegates, was mm -hmm. set up to ensure that uh, there were uh, women elected to the new Ard Corolla of Sinn Féin. Uh, and there were, as it happened, there were a number then elected. And these included um, Kathleen Clark, uh, Grace Plunkett, I'm just looking at some of the names here, um, Markovich, of course. Uh, so th that, that, that effort was there. And I think you'll agree that um, they certainly made their mark uh, small in number, although they were at that level, they weren't small in number in the rank and file. If you want, they were they were, they were very much involved in coming them on was central, uh, and and would have used the mansion house as well for their conventions and their meetings yeah. and so on. Um, it, it was after I think, as you say, later on they felt that the promise uh, of what of of what had happened and what what was to come, uh, they felt very much had been let down and betrayed uh, at the time. Um, and of course, like so many uh, aspects of this, a lot of the, the the really difficult work and drudgery and so on that happened was done by women, um, notably women who worked in the mansion house itself. Um, Kathleen McKenna uh, describes it and she talks about, she, she wrote about how central the mansion house was and she was one of these common among women who did such a huge amount of work, as you say. Irish bulletin, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the things I find uh, frustrating about the, the depiction, I know they were the signatories of the declaration for the anti-conscription campaign, but 
actually some of the largest contingents in your Le Mans in uh, June 1918 and various days before that. Uh, say the Irish Women Workers Union was the very largest contingent, about 4,000 women marched on the streets um, to indicate their resistance to conscription. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the notable uh, outcomes of the centenary a couple of years ago in 2018. Um, that that Law and Amon was highlighted very much by historians mm. like yourself and Liz Gillis, uh, something that many historians wouldn't have been very aware of, but uh, it was highlighted. And I remember we did have an event outside the Mansion House to mark that at that mm. day, which, which which was a a great occasion. There's an interest go back to the trade unions. Um, in November 1918, uh, O'Neill spoke uh, to the Irish Trade Union uh, Congress in the Mansion House, and it was the, it, that was the, the, the meeting where they decided that they wouldn't stand in the 1918 general election. We won't go into the reasons for it and all the, the debate around it, it still goes on. But the interesting thing is the quote, because it really shows uh, O'Neill as a champion of free speech and that the House should be an open house. And he said, we are in the freest spot upon earth, and from time to time, they're met within the portals of the Mansion House, people of different degrees, socially, politically, and perhaps morally. Indeed, on the flag outside might be inscribed that the Mansion House is the home of civil and religious liberty. So I think it's very interesting that it's a, a great insight into the to his, um, his view. So, I mean, the logic of that then was after the um, 1918 election, the sweeping victory of Sinn Féin, he opened the Mansion House to the dawn, and there was an attempt by Dublin Castle to prevent it. Um, he was politely requested, <laughs> or maybe not so politely, uh, mm. not to do so, but he, he did. And, uh, you know, we know the, the, the massive significance of the first dawn. Uh, Maura Comerford uh, was there on the day of the, the, uh, the, the first dawn, 21st of January 1919, and she says that they had a contingency plan in case they were raided. She described the, the mansion house as a place of many secrets. So they yeah. they actually had, uh, you know, secret passageways ready to, to escape for the TDs who were able to attend. Of course, many of them were in prison, uh, but they were ready to go if, they were, if there was a raid uh, on, on the house uh, at that stage. I have to say, <laughs> um, I'm sure lots of people are like me are wondering, are those secret passages still accessible and have Lord Mayor's used them for any reason over the years? Yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't have occasion to, to use <laughs> them <laughs> and I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have the time to go and look for them. But um, yeah, I, I, I'd say there, there's, there's probably tunnels all over the place. Um, so yeah, I mean, to go in then, I suppose to 1919, I think it's often forgotten because of the Salahed Beg ambush that uh, the emphasis at the start of 1919 was very much on seeking recognition of Dáil Éireann, uh, seeking a place at the International Peace Conference in Paris. You know, that there, there was a path there for peaceful and democratic means. But unfortunately, the British government at the time uh, was not prepared to recognise that. Uh, and as a result, the, the war escalated in, in, in 1919. Um, the, one of the first signs of that was the 12th of July, 1919. Uh, Arthur Griffith was due to give a lecture in the Mansion House, and that was banned. Uh, so thereafter, you had the banning of Sinn Féin, the banning of the doll itself. Yeah. Um, and as a result of that, really, the, the, uh, the war escalated. Eanoch uh, and was uh, something that was held in the Mansion House every year. Uh, and you know, there was a Christmas fair up until the 1980s, but this one was a, would have been a really big event at that time. Uh, it was a showcase for Irish goods. That was banned by the British government uh, in 1919. And actually it's reported that there were 500 British soldiers surrounded with fixed bayonets surrounded the Mansion House to try to prevent the, the fair. So that, that was the, um, the atmosphere of the, very much of the time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's extraordinary when we think about it that uh, the risks that were taken for um, both those who had been elected in 1918 in December and the likes of Lawrence O'Neill and the other workers in the uh, mansion house who prepared to support him 
in inviting in uh, the first all. I mean, one of the stories you tell, which I always think is fascinating, is uh, on that you know, the 19th of January in 1921, or no, 21st, wasn't it? Um, with, in the morning, they had uh, returned prisoners of war from Germany from the Royal Dublin Fusiliers being entertained. And then in the afternoon, the first door kicks off. That's and right, yeah. There yeah. are lots of incidents like that, that you describe in the book that come up through various other sources as well, uh, like, you know, later on when the truce negotiations were going on and Harry Boland being ushered out one door because Lord French, the Lord Lieutenant, was coming in another one. <laughs> you know, that it, there, there was quite a lot of management going on and it seems a little comic now when you think about it, but actually they were in danger of their lives when you think that well, certainly, the auxiliaries and the Black and Tans were They around. certainly were and Lawrence O'Neill himself took great risks. As I said, while he he wasn't a member of Sinn Féin, he, he would have been seen by the British as very much identified with the doll. Uh, the doll actually used, uh, when it was driven underground, it used the mansion house as its address, and it, you'd see it on headed paper, uh, doll, air and care of the, the secretary, mansion house. Yeah. Um, and of course, we'd had uh, Tomás McCorton, the Lord Mayor of Cork, had been assassinated by British forces. Um, you had a serving mayor, Clancy and O'Callaghan, and former mayor, in Limerick. So there's no doubt that O'Neill's life was in danger. And the house was raided. He, he described at a meeting of the corporation how the house had been raided on numerous occasions and that there had been uh, damage and pilfering, as he described it, yeah. by the Crown forces. So we're not, we don't know what was taken, but uh, I suppose it shared it in common with many homes throughout the country at that time. Um, well, one little thing I forgot to mention, which is very topical, in the, in uh, March 1919, uh, the ma the mansion house had to be closed because of the flu pandemic. Yes, uh, of course. The 1918-1919 flu pandemic was still going on, and it was so bad at that stage that uh, they had to stop public gatherings, uh, and the mansion house was was completely closed um, at that stage. So um, another point in going into 1920. Um, of course, the, 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 the war intensified and um, the, the local elections were held. So you had local elections, rural in the, uh, or the county elections, I think they were called, uh, in one part of the year, and then the, the urban elections later. One was in January, one was in June. I, I, I forget which was which about, but um, the, the point was, of course, again, there was a, a, a very large victory for Sinn Féin. Uh, but uh, O'Neill was re-elected. Uh, as I mentioned, Tom Kelly was due to be the, the Lord Mayor. He His health had broken when he was in prison, so O'Neill uh, continued. And the, um, the, the, the raids and so on on the mansion house uh, continued. And in December um, 1920, the, uh, I'll just try and get this to, to work here now. Um, December 1920, the uh, City Hall was actually taken over uh, by uh, the, the, the British forces. Mm -hmm. And they, um, I'm sorry, I'm, yes, here we are. Th this shows, uh, this is just outside City Hall, and this is the auxiliaries uh, stopping a post office van. You can see the, the post office bags, the mail bags in the van. And just in the top corner in the right here, that's actually the corner of City Hall. So City Hall was taken over uh, by British forces because the corporation had pledged allegiance to the Dáil and they'd broken links with the local government board. So um, the British decided, well, we're going to take over their assets. So they took over City Hall. This photograph would be taken from City Hall. Across here, you can see the rates office and this is the barricade, this is the way into Dublin Castle. So this, I think, really shows the atmosphere uh, in the streets of Dublin um, at the time. Um, and well, that's it's, another it's, one there of the, yeah. the, the British Army at City Hall, uh, barbed wire entanglements. So I suppose this brings us really then into uh, 21 and the, the centenary that we're, we're marking. Um, 
O'Neill was very interested, obviously, in, in all the efforts that were made, being made official and unofficial uh, for peace feelers and to, to see if negotiations could uh, succeed. So we have a description, we don't have an exact date, but someday in uh, mid-June 1921, uh, a knock came to the door of the mansion house and it was Tom Casement, Roger Casement's brother. And he was on a mission from uh, Jan Smuts, who was the South African Prime Minister, who was in touch with Lloyd George and he was interested in brokering some kind of peace settlement in Ireland. Uh, it's said that he... Uh, he had a, a major hand in the speech of the English King, George V, uh, at the opening of the, the six-county parliament in Belfast. Um, but Smuts was interested in uh, peace brokering, and he, he brought the message. Tom Casement brought, brought the message. And this led on then to the start of the correspondence between uh, Lloyd George and de Valera, which then led to the truce. And this is the, the scene on uh, I think the the, the 8th of July, yeah. uh, the 7th of July actually, or the 8th of July in uh, 21, exactly 100 years ago, uh, outside the mansion house. Uh, de Valera had invited Craig, uh, the, the Unionist Prime Minister uh, in the North, because it, de Valera's idea was that they should have a common approach to the British government. He didn't want to recognise partition. Uh, Craig refused to, to come, but the Southern Unionists uh, did indeed uh, attend and there's an interesting quote from uh, Lawrence O'Neill uh, on that point. He said that it was very hopeful uh, that the Southern Unionists had attended, and that um, you know there, there was maybe prospect of a coming together. And it was interesting that he made that statement at a meeting of the corporation because, as well as all this going on, uh, the underground doll, which then were, was able to meet again in, in public. Uh, the truce negotiations, the peace talks, Dublin Corporation itself, the City Council was actually meeting uh, in, in the Mansion House as well because the City Hall was still occupied and the occupation of the City Hall did not end actually till the end of 1921. So it really was all happening uh, in the Mansion House. I mean, I think it's amazing that O'Neill managed to hang on to not just his humanity, but his optimism in the face of the enormous difficulties that were facing people in Dublin, uh, well, in Ireland at the time, but particularly in Dublin, where the uh, Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries were still very much on the streets and still very involved in illegal activities, including stealing the mail, <laughs> which was very much against the law. But uh, one of the other photographs that comes from the time that I think says an awful lot about the atmosphere, like the one you showed previously with the barricades going up, would be of people saying the rosary outside the mansion house, literally on their knees on the ground, praying for uh, a resolution and um, probably foreshadowing to some extent the acceptance of the treaty when it did come, because there was obviously far more popular uh, desire for a settlement even however flawed it might be seen. What would you think of, I mean, I know O'Neill felt that there should be as equitable a distribution of the, the rights and wrongs as possible, but in terms of what was going on, for instance, with Sinn Féin and of course with de Valera as president. Yeah, I, I, I think um, O'Neill, he, he, he stepped back from political controversy in the sense that he didn't really, uh, he, he didn't really get involved in the treaty debate. Although he did later um, serve as a, a pro-treaty TD, but he, he he really didn't take any part. Certainly didn't take any part in the civil war, and he he actually was involved in several moves to try to prevent, initially prevent the civil war, and then to broker a peace agreement. So he was very much a man of peace, but he was a Democrat as well. I mean, he was very much, uh, he, he really recognised that the Dáil was the democratic uh, decision of the Irish people for independence. And, and that I think that was very much the basis of his position and uh, the position of free speech. Um, 
the truth, uh, it, I, I suppose we should talk a little bit about, obviously, <laughs> for the, the centenary. This is a picture, again, of uh, the Mansion House crowd, and you can actually recognise the the uh, buildings across yeah. the road. They're, they're very much the same today, uh, exactly the same uh, layout of those buildings. Um, this is uh, one of my favourite pictures of the time, and it, it gives you a very good indication of the Mansion House. In the background, you can see men sitting on a wall, and that was what was called a curtain wall, which was on either side of the mansion house at that time. That's now gone, uh, but it gives you a great sense of it. And the, but there's a boy singing. Uh, so there was really jubilation. As you say, there was a huge desire for peace. Um, people had really been terrorised by the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries, particularly in Dublin, but also in other parts of the country, of course, where the conflict was at its height. Um, and the atmosphere, there was a terrible atmosphere of tension in Dublin because everything was so close, you know, the night raids, uh, Crown Forces vehicles rushing through the streets, you know, ambushes and so on. So there was a release of tension. And th th this is, I think, is a great photograph of a boy singing. We don't know who he is. And I'd, I'd love to know if anyone knows who, the, who, the, who this boy singing is. Um, the, the truce went, uh, talks went on for several days, and we think this is the 7th or 8th of July um, when MacReady appeared. Now, this is MacReady here on the left, uh, and you can see in his, in his uh, tunic pocket the outline of an automatic uh, revolver or automatic, an automatic pistol, which obviously uh, he, he, was, he was hedging his bets just in case things went wrong. And this is O'Neill. Uh, on the right there, looking very happy. Um, a truce was being brokered and, you know, there was going to be uh, at least some period of peace. Um, the, the IRA was represented by uh, Eamon Duggan and, uh, and others. And it was really significant that the British uh, uh, command had, had actually recognised the IRA as an army as a legitimate army, because that's in effect what the truce meant. Uh, they came to mutual terms, mutual agreement in terms of what both sides militarily could and couldn't do. And, you know, th th it was only a few months since Lloyd George had described uh, the IRA as a murder gang and said we have murder by the throat and so on. And there were, there were strong elements within the British establishment, within his own government, who wanted to you know, sweep the country with armoured cars and tanks and airplanes and round everybody up. But they realised they couldn't do that, that it, it, it couldn't be sustained. They had to think of British public opinion. They had to think of world opinion, particularly American public opinion. Um, mm -hmm. So they had to come to some form of settlement, uh, they believed. But I, I think it was very much within the context of uh, imperial policy and the empire. They had uh, brought in the Government of Ireland Act, partition had been imposed or was beginning to be imposed. So they wanted to ensure that it was in within that context. But I think that was, I suppose that was from the point of view of nationalist Ireland, that that had yet to come. There was, I think, jubilation that the truce had happened. And there was people were very, very hopeful uh, about what the outcome could be. Well, uh, you're obviously correct there, but, you know, that was the one time I'm sure that McCready was absolutely astonished to be cheered by the crowd as he was going into uh, the mansion house. Um, but as you said, you know, it was all done in the context of uh, the best interests of the British Empire. And it was, but it was a victory for the IRA, not just in the sense that there was finally a recognition that they had been at war, which had never been conceded up to that, but they hadn't actually declared war formally until the previous April. Uh, how, I've, I've never quite understood why they didn't, because de Valera, for instance, seemed to have been quite keen on pursuing a formal war, you know, in his promotion of the burning of the uh, the attack on the Custom House in May and uh, various other mistakes militarily that he had made. But he wasn't listening to the militarily wiser advice of Collins and Mulcahy and the others uh, about the strength of the IRA being as a guerrilla force. 
So would that have had something to do with a formal war not being declared that they had actually managed to sit on them up to that point? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I suppose in a way that they, they had declared war uh, I, it, with the, with the uh, declarations that were made at the opening of the first doll, in a sense. Uh, but as you say, the formal kind of military, I suppose the, the position was that they felt, at, certainly at the start of 1919, that um, they had uh, received a democratic mandate. Mm. And it was for the British government to recognise that. Uh, formally, the, the, the raids and so on that were being carried on by the IRA at that stage were raids for arms. And the other actions would have been presented as defensive, essentially, to equip the, their army and to defend uh, themselves and, and the community. So I suppose, in a formal sense, the, the, the declaration of war, um, you know, it was never going to be a conventional war. It was never going to be, you know, armies lined up in a battlefield. As you say, essentially, it was guerrilla, guerrilla warfare. Yeah. But I suppose a key part about that was that, um, and this brings us back to the prisoners, that uh, they would have said, well, you know, our our men and women fought as soldiers, uh, but were not being recognised as such, were being held as criminals. And we ha you had the court martials then, which I, I should have mentioned, in mm -hmm. the context of the city hall, uh, very much always related to the mansion house, nine of those who were executed uh, between... Uh, January and June 1921 were actually court-martialed in the city hall yeah. and it was very much uh, I suppose a, a gesture of contempt by Dublin Castle that they'd seized our civic building and now they were going to previous ones previous court-martials such as those of Kevin Barry had been held in British Army barracks but here they were used in the city hall and it was sending very much a message to the city and the civic authorities that we can't have you pledging allegiance to the doll. So this is what we're going to do. So nine of those prisoners were uh, court-martialed or there were, were actually executed. And they were nine of the ten known as the Mount Joy Ten who were, re who were then reinterred uh, in Glasnevin in uh, 2001. Yeah. So, it, you know, that was very much the, the scene uh, at the time. Yeah, I, mean, I, I we're running out of time here because I want to let the audience come in. There are already some questions coming. I'll up. just go to one but, more screen yeah, share before we yes, go to the questions because uh, I just think this is a, a kind of suitable way uh, to, if I can find it now. Um, yeah, Th this last uh, image, um, if, it, if I can get it to come up. Uh, yeah, Th this is the boy again who was singing, but down in the bottom left, uh, you have a man called James Conway, and he was a member of Dublin Fire Brigade, and he's been identified by our great Dublin Fire Brigade historian, Laz Fallon. Yeah. Uh, the, the, to police the truce around the mansion house and around the city, they actually used the fire brigade, Dublin Fire Brigade officers were used around the mansion house to marshal the crowds and so on. And one of them was this man, James Conley, but, or James Conway, I should say. But uh, of course, unbeknownst to the British, James Conway was a member of the IRA and he'd been in the Citizen Army, uh, as were many of the fire brigade uh, members had been uh, active and were still active uh, with the Republican forces. So I think, I think this photograph is, is a very telling one. So I leave the images with that and, and I'm just thankful that the screen share seems to have worked without any major hitch. Uh, thank you very much, Michal. I mean, that was fascinating. And uh, as I said, the book is available from the libraries. Um, that is the Mansion House. Uh, uh, sorry, what's the exact title? I have it here in front of me somewhere. Um, no. I've forgotten it, but I, I'll put it in in the chat in a minute. Uh, but it is the Mansion House and the Irish Revolution that's uh, finally got it right. Uh, 
We have already one or two questions and uh, some comments. So I'll just go with the first question, which also contains a compliment to you. Um, and uh, it's asking how long, um, or a, a book about uh, how women were kept out of politics by more conservative uh, Sinn Féin politicians before independence and how that was carried on. Now I'm going to actually uh, respond to Paul Nugent uh, privately if you can put in your email address Paul because we could be a long time here. There's been some marvellous research done in the last 10 or 15 years about this very subject unless you want to come in on it. Uh, but Paul has also put in a question about uh, whether we know what the boy was singing in the photograph. Well, I'm afraid we don't. Uh, we, we don't have a name either, unfortunately. So it's something I'd like to find out. Um, so if anyone out there can, can assist us, we'd be very, very happy. Um, I think it related to, 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 the, to the, um, the role of women. It, I mean, it is fair to say as well that uh, Sinn Féin, for all its weaknesses, it was an advance of the other political forces at the time in terms of the involvement of women. Um, and you know the, the the Sinn Féin women certainly asserted themselves, uh, as did as did Cumann Amman. Um, I think that's important to say. It's what happened afterwards. I think was the where, where things started to go backwards. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, just going back a few years, I'm, I'm avoiding that one because I could be <laughs> get up on my high horse and stay there a long time. Um, Eileen wondered how long was the mansion house closed because of the flu. I think I think it was closed for several months, mm -hmm. um, it, because you had the, you had obviously the flu epidemic. But then, of course, the, the the political situation was getting more tense and so on, and there was more repression, so it was more difficult for them to to meet. As I said, the the uh, lecture by Griffith was banned in July, so the, that was the, the the increasing pattern through through the year. But it had a devastating effect on Dublin and Ireland, you know, which is often forgotten. And I think. People say, oh, it was because, it, you know, people in retrospect are looking at the war of independence and so on, that, that eclipsed it. And it did to a certain extent. But I think also in the public memory, you know, it hit young people and children very badly. Uh, but the, as you know, the, the infant mortality and child mortality rate uh, was very high in any case. Yeah. So, you know, the deaths of children and young people was very much a part of life at the time, tragically. So Michael wants to know what were the benefits for Britain in signing the truce in July 1921? The benefits to? Britain. The benefits to Britain, well, I, I don't think there was a, well, from their point of view, I, I, it gave them a respite. Um, I, I think they did, they did see it in the context of the Government of Ireland Act. They pinned everything on that, that, um, they had established the Northern Parliament in the six counties and they wanted to consolidate that. They had already, in fact, the, the special constabulary uh, was established in November 1920. So it was actually established before the Northern Parliament. So um, th they were very much gearing up for partition. And the, their aim then was how do you come to a settlement uh, with the 26 counties or nationalist Ireland as they would have seen it or Southern Ireland uh, that maintains the interests of the empire. So I suppose the truce wouldn't have been the terms they wanted. Um, they talked about some form of truce in December 1920, uh, which would have been totally unacceptable to the Republicans. Uh, it was basically a surrender. And mm -hmm. uh, so they, they, they were forced basically to the negotiating table in terms of the truce. So they wouldn't have been very happy with the what they had to agree to, but they were then, the, the challenge then was to use the opportunity to, uh, to achieve an outcome which kept Ireland as a whole within the empire, uh, obviously to a lesser extent in the, in the 26 counties. And then that brings us across to the treaty negotiations and so on, which we could, <laughs> We could have uh, and will have, I'm sure, no several, several, several webinars on. <laughs> but 
You know, I think too that the international situation probably did have uh, an impact, not so much on the hawks in the British government, but on the likes of Lloyd George, who was a pragmatist when it came down to it. And they were getting uh, a lot of grief from around the world that not to the extent, for instance, that Wilson, Woodrow, President Wilson of the US uh, was honoring his promise to recognize the self-determination of small nations uh, but at the peace conference you know there was uh, a lot of pushback because of the incidents things like the Croke Park killings the previous winter um, and the escalation and violence that had occurred in the first few months of um, 1921 so that by July you know that it's not necessarily that there were enormous benefits, though I totally agree with you about their approach to Northern Ireland, but that um, there weren't very many benefits in carrying on the way, say, the likes of Sir Hamer Greenwood would have wanted yeah. to do. And McCready, uh, which I meant to mention, actually, he, he had, there's a great quote from him where he talked about, he loathed the, the country, he loathed Ireland. Yeah. At, uh, he hated us even more than the Bosch, as he described the Germans. Yeah, you know? so <laughs> he, he, was the, he was the one then that had to go and sit and sign the truth. Yeah, though, you know, there were officials in the Dublin Castle administration, um, McMahon, for instance, who was quite friendly with Lawrence O'Neill. I can't remember his exact title, but, uh, you know, it was over sent there really in the last few months. So there were um, recognitions in some parts, again, yeah. of the pragmatic necessity. Mm. To and I think O'Neill uh, managed to, was one of his talents, he managed on a personal basis to keep on good terms with, you know, people from all sides, yeah. uh, which really was to everybody's advantage, uh, I suppose, that he was in he was in that position and probably why he kept he, he was re-elected so often because people realized he was a he was a negotiator or a facilitator of negotiations. Mm. Eileen wondered if the boy was singing the soldier song because it was used at many public meetings at that time. Well quite quite likely. He probably had yeah. a he probably had a medley. I, I'm looking at the American flag there in, in, in the photo behind it's quite interesting. And what you say about the the peace conference, I think there was a lot of disappointment at, at Wilson. Uh, you know, as we know, of course, Wilson yeah. um the, the peace conference didn't work out the way Wilson wanted. Uh but the, it ended up being very much dominated by the British and French Empire. And I think there was disappointment in Ireland at that, that Wilson didn't recognise uh, the Republic as they had hoped he would. Um, and the peace conference, they, they never, they got no hearing at it. Uh, and I think in, in Liam Mello's speech against the treaty, he talks about how the the League of Nations was a disappointment in the sense that the, the, from out of Versailles, Britain and France still dominated. And of course you had at the, at the very same time, the, uh, the sykes pico agreement, the the, the uh, partition of Palestine, and all of that uh, mm. that was happening, the suppression of uh, nationalists in Egypt and India, you know, and all of that was looked on, looked at in Ireland as well at the same time. Okay, sorry, I'm just uh, I've managed to um, block you out there, Michal, trying to read some of the comments. Um, Michal was wondering, um. Uh, think it obviously was, but not, as you said, in a, in a straightforward way. Was it, is it right to say that the truce was a stepping stone towards the Anglo-Irish Treaty? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the stepping stone uh, analogy, yeah. Well, clearly it was. I mean, as I said earlier, the, the correspondence between Lloyd George and De Valera had started already. That had started uh, at the end of June. So uh, they, they were already, um, I suppose, uh, in the preliminaries of negotiations. And the, the, the mansion house was very much, uh, I suppose, uh, negotiation central. That's where everything was happening. Uh, the, the cabinet was meeting there. Uh, the doll was able to meet there again uh, after the truce. Uh, and the, the most famous image of the doll, which is uh, which you can see in the mansion house in the hallway of the round room, uh, that really iconic image, 
is from August uh, 1921, uh, with the sun streaming in the roof of the round room or the yeah. ceiling of the round room. Uh, that was a, a meeting of the doll. And they met, I think for the last time, the first doll met, or the second doll met in the mansion house. Uh, it had been elected, of course, in, in May 21. But it, it, the last time it met in the Mansion House was September 21, and that was to uh, mandate the negotiators. Yeah. So they were then, they were given their mandate, and the negotiators, the delegation was picked, and that was the delegation then which uh, negotiated the treaty. And we won't get into the whole uh, debate about whether Dev should have gone and all the rest of it. Um, that, that's the debate for another day. But I suppose maybe to finish up on that point, um, there's a very poignant scene described by Frank Gallagher um, in the Four Glorious Years when the treaty was brought back in, uh, on the 6th of December at uh, 21. There was actually a concert or, a, or a, a commemoration being held in the Mansion House for the Italian poet Dante. It was organised by Count Plunkett and they were all there, including De Valera, when the news came in that the treaty had been signed and De Valera was furious that it had been signed without re referral back mm. to the Dáil cabinet and he's described by Lawrence O'Neill as sitting white-faced at the event. And then later, to the, I think the next day, uh, there was a cabinet meeting held in what is now the drawing room of the Mansion House uh, and there are very large doors between the drawing room and the oak room. And Frank Gallagher describes he's in the oak room with the world's press yeah. Uh, gathered and he can hear the argument in the cabinet room you know on the other side of the double doors so Frank Gallagher said he had to raise his voice as he spoke to the press so they couldn't hear the argument yeah. in, the, in the cabinet you know of course it had a very tragic um, outcome uh, but you know I, I, it always struck me as a very evocative scene in, in the mansion house and something there where you can actually go and see where this happened you know mm. um, interesting comment here um, from Paul who said that if General McCready should have gone home sooner if he didn't like us <laughs> um, well I think they were, we, they were trying their best to get him to go home alright but <laughs> Timothy has pointed out that uh, Richard Mulcahy as Chief of Staff uh, in his mind, figured that the war had begun in September 1919 when the doll was banned. So that I, I'm being very literal about formal declarations of war, but uh, it's an interesting point. Um, Neil Ring, and thank you for your kind comments, Neil, but he's asking in the days before social media, how did word of the truth spread? Well, if you come back on Friday, that's what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> because there was incredible press coverage literally all around the world um, and we won't have time to go into it now but um, I'm going to have to wind up because we're nearly out of time. Um, Neil, to the, uh, there was a truce document which as you just put it's not quite in the way that uh, it's often been portrayed uh, that came out of those original negotiations. And Paul points out that in the uh, picture behind me, the American flag is upside down <laughs> and it's a common mistake. Um, it's a contemporary it's a picture. Secret, it? <laughs> I, I could, can't actually see it clearly enough, so not commenting either way and wouldn't know since he's living in the States. So I imagine he probably is fairly well au fait with it. Um, I'm going to hand back to Anne-Marie and she can tell you about a talk tomorrow by my colleague uh, Cormac Moore, another historian in residence. Michal, thanks very much for putting up with me. And all can, the I just, can I just give the last word to a woman, please? <laughs> I, I always like to, anytime I do a talk on this, I always like to give the word, the last word to Mara Comerford because I think yeah. it's one of the best quotes. It's about the first doll meeting in the mansion house. And she said, never was the past so near or the present so brave or the future so full of hope. Well, yes. Thank you very much, Michal. Okay, well, I want to say thanks very much to both Mary Muldowney and Michal, um, and Michal McDunca for uh, giving a very lively, very engaging talk today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure you all did too. Uh, so I would also like to thank my co-host, Stephanie Rousseau, for coming here today and for helping out. 
And also, I would like to thank uh, everybody in the audience for attending. If you're interested in the, tr the rest of the Truth Talks, there's another one on tomorrow at 1 p.m. also. It's by um, historian Dr. Cormac Moore, and it's called The Guns Are Silent, But They Remain in the Hands of the Irish Volunteers. So that's on tomorrow at one o'clock. So hopefully maybe some of you can join us then. And then it remains to be said to say thanks very much for everybody for coming today. And thank you again for the talk. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you then. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.